And a good day to you, sir. And ma'am. Good day to you. <laughs> and sir. Hello, everybody. Welcome Hello. to another entire Bible read through. Whoop, whoop. Blessed to be here with you folks on this fine day. You guys done a great job again, leaving your questions and comments and your research. Super blessed by your efforts. Thank you, everybody who takes the time to participate in this, watch this, and uh, and leave your 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 comments. It, it's amazing. You guys are doing such an amazing job. So, just starting off with that, want to welcome everybody who might be new. My name is Nathan Wheeler, founder of the ministry here at Yeshua Network and Truth Me Free. This is my buddy Alex, best bud, smart guy, great radio voice. So you know, be uh, sure to to check him out too. And uh, yeah, we got this uh, entire Bible read through that we do. We obviously started at page one, word one, and we're reading all the way through. So uh, if you see that it's called the entire Bible read through and it's only Luke 20, 21 on the screen there in front of you, uh, obviously it's not the whole Bible in one video. That's my point. So go ahead and check that out that currently on YouTube. Something. That would be something. That would be a very long video. Uh, go ahead and check that out on Yeshua Network on uh, YouTube or Yeshua.com when uh, that gets up and running. Uh, right now, it's just a template page, but it is being worked on. I'm super excited about what's going on with that, too. And, uh, yeah, other than that, we have many groups. If you need prayer, if you want to give testimony, if you want to be plugged into a body of Christ, maybe you don't have a church that you go to. Maybe you're in the process of finding a new church or something like that. If you want to be plugged into a body of Christ that can pray for you and be there for you and that you can be a part of, please join us currently at Facebook. Uh, dot com forward slash Yeshua official. Okay, so that's where you can find us. All right, I think that's a pretty good intro for now. Uh, anything I might be missing, guys? I think oh, you got it all. Hashtag be the light. Hashtag be the light coming up. Just a few days. So if you want to light a candle and stand in unity with us, also for brothers and sisters all around the world, light a candle with us in unity on the 22nd of every month. Because um, the world wants to divide us. And that's how the devil gains his strength is by us being divided. And the house divided cannot stand. So be unified with us. Word. Join us on that group at Yeshua Network as well. Okay. Awesome. That's good. Uh, let us know you guys if uh, there's any technical issues with the video feed or the audio feed it looks a little wonky on my end but that could just be what no it looks happens. wonky on my end too um, it might be just us our internet connections it might be if anybody out there if the video is choppy or the audio is choppy please let us know if you say nothing we'll assume that it's all good okay ricardo says it's looking good and ricardo is in uh another hemisphere so i think we're okay then okay so it's just me and you good yeah it might be I'll because we're both on the on the zoom while we're trying to do this so sarah says it's kind of jumpy for her it is jumpy yeah but if you can hear us does it does it sound okay As long as we don't sound robotic or choppy. That's mm -hmm. kind of the important part. Yeah, it looks... No problem here except a little bit of a black fuzz. Yeah, that's just the green screen thing yeah. going on by my head. Yeah, that actually is probably in my... Good going, Alex. Just kidding. Sounds okay. Great. Thank you, guys. Appreciate the feedback. It's laggy, but you sound good. Okay, great. That's all it really matters. So, fantastic. All right. Just ignore us. Yes. Pretty brutal in my neighborhood. High winds and blowing snow. Oh, geez, Bob. Yes. Wow. Snow? Oh. Snow, that sucks. <laughs> Where are you in the world? <laughs> Dang, that does suck. Isn't it? It's March. I guess it does snow in March yeah, in some places. Yeah, it could still be pretty cold up north. Um. Okay. All right. Let's kick it off. Thank Luke you guys 20. for uh, thank you guys for the tech feedback here. So yeah, Luke yes. twenty. You want to start us off no, this time? No, no general comments. So we're just going to jump on into twenty. What we do have a general comment for twenty one. So we'll read that when we get there. Uh, sure, I'll read us off here. At the Cameron Peterson, Luke twenty eight, twenty verse eight. Bing. Got to make sure that is read right. And Yeshua said to them, "Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things." This whole situation kind of left me thinking. It strikes me as a teaching on the authority that God gives to not only Yeshua, but also us. When probed about his authority, Yeshua asked a question about John the Baptist. I took this to be a question about something which the general public knew was 
from God. It seems like he's making the point that it is undeniable who gives him the authority, just like in John the Baptist case. It's clear it's from God. Essentially, we let the power of God prove our authority in this world. Mm, very, very good point. This discussion reminded me of a spirit of spiritual battles. It's like evil spirits challenge us as if they have a claim of authority over us, but our authority is given by God, who is more powerful. In spiritual battles, though, we often state whose authority we have in the name of Yeshua, but here he says that he won't tell them. I'm wondering if this is just a way of pointing out their hypocrisy, ignorance, or if he has a deeper significance. Any thoughts? Or if it has a deeper significance, any thoughts? I I think he I think he's just trying to point out that I think the, the, it seems to me from scripture personally that the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes and the, basically the temple leaders are quote unquote at the time. Like if you do research, there was a lot of people who didn't know how to read and write at the time. Uh, and for sure, they didn't know how to read and write in Hebrew. Uh, if anything, it was Aramaic. Uh, so it's like, I feel like they are just super pompous and think they're smarter and better than everybody else. Which is kind of still true today if you go to Jerusalem. So on top of that, um, I feel like, uh, yeah, like, you know, how do I say it? Um I feel like what he's doing is he's just calling them out for not just their hypocrisy, but being like, you're not smarter than me. Uh, and, and I think the passage even says that for he saw their craftiness. Right. And he says, why are you trying to like, well, he says that later. Sorry, I'm, I'm mingling that with something else. But uh, um, so that's that's what I perceive. He's just trying to show them like you're not you're not the smartest people here, guys. Uh, along with pointing out, too, that they know the answer. Like if he says the answer. It's like one of those things where it just has the ability to be argued, but if he gets them to confess it, they basically dig their own graves. And ironically enough, this is actually something they teach you in debate school <laughs> or debate classes. Like if you can get the person to admit uh, their own parameter, then you can use that parameter against them. So in all reality, what they're trying to do here is they're trying to get Yeshua to say, obviously, what we all know, that God is his authority. But by him getting them to not say it, they're actually admitting that they know exactly what the source is. That's why they can't say it. So I don't know. I, I think it's I, what you, you wrote, but I think it's a little bit more also just telling them they're not the sharpest tools in the shed there. What are your thoughts, Mr. Lebowski? You got anything? Yeah, I, I think... Um, I think he's pointing out for sure. He's pointing out their hypocrisy and he's pointing out also a little bit their cowardice. Ca cowardice. They're yeah. asking him to stand up and say he's by the authority of God. And then they, mm -hmm. they can now, at that point, they can go prove it, prove it, prove it. Or whatever it is right. that they, they would do next if he said that because they're assuming he's going to say that. Right. He's telling yeah. them, well, you want me to stand up and testify and take a chance? Okay. Would you take a chance of how you feel about the testimony of of John the Baptist? Right. And obviously they're like they're they start to reason it out and go, well, if we say it's from God, then uh oh. And if we say yeah. it's from not, then we're gonna get our butts kicked. So we're gonna we're gonna pretend like we don't know. Which is also an interesting thing, but I don't know if somebody yeah, nobody talks about it. So the other thing interesting is it's the reverse opposite for Yeshua, right? Like if he says it's from God, they could technically stone him because he's in front of everybody. Right. Right. So, and they're worried that if they say it's not from God, he'll get stoned by the crowd. They'll get stoned by the crowd. So that's an interesting twist. Right. Yeah, I just he just calls him out, calls him out yeah, on sure how does. um they are they're 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 not asking the question to know the truth; they're asking the question <laughs> to use it as a weapon against him. All right. Yeah. Exactly. Dirty rats. All right. Dirty. Sharon Lewis Roberts is next thing. <laughs> dirty rats. <laughs> you dirty bad. <laughs> Um, Sharon Lewis Roberts, uh, Luke 20 verses nine through 16 parable of the vine growers. Um, I might be way off, but this is just a summary of what I've got from it. I've taken the 
I've taken the, the vine growers as the scribes and chief priests. The slaves were the prophets sent with messages previously. Uh, the servants, yeah, servants and slaves. The beloved son is Yeshua. The vineyard is the Holy Spirit or temple or both even. The produce is the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Mm. They didn't accept the heir because of fear of losing their status. They didn't want the Holy Spirit or religion to go out to every nation. They wanted to hold on to what they had. Yeshua told the parable and even confirmed his impending death, stating that the, vi the vineyard uh, would be given to others, i.e. the Gentiles, and that they would be destroyed, wondering if that was a reflection on the temple being destroyed in 70 AD. Also in Isaiah chapter 5, the parable of the vineyard is mentioned where it was prophesied the same, that it would be destroyed. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Very good stuff. Jennifer Conley, Luke 20, 16 through 18. He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Yeshua looked directly at them and said, then what is the meaning of that, of that which is written? The stone the builders reject has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken into pieces. Anyone whom it falls will be crushed. This seems strange to me when I read it that they said certainly not or God forbid when the vine dresser or vine dressers are destroyed and the stewardship gives given to others. They knew he was speaking of them, but did they not think that was just? Were they that hardened and blind about what has been done to God in flesh and the prophets? Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord was just proclaimed, and he was the chief cornerstone. It was so interesting that the fear of man was more intense for them than the fear of God. They had to twist their story of authority when questioned so that the people would not rise up, but would lie instead of admit his place, even though all prophecies spoke of him coming. Their eyes must have been blinded by the Lord to complete his mission. Psalms 118.22, the stone which the builders refuse is become the headstone of the corner. Matthew 21.42, Yeshua said unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which is the builders reject? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Ephesians 2.20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Yeshua Messiah himself being the chief cornerstone. 1 Peter 2.47, to whom coming as to a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as live lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God for Yeshua. Wherefore also is it contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the cornerstone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You ask great questions, Jennifer. You know, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to think what was going on through their minds and how conflicted they must have been, you know, psychologically, emotionally at this time. It must have been a very, very strange experience for them. I agree. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. Are you thinking or are you reading? I'm just, I'm just rereading um, Jennifer's question, which is, um, they knew he was speaking of them, but did they not think that was just? Um, you know, the, the whole God forbid may have been not a response to whether or not the parable was just, but just responding to the horror of the parable, meaning they have no self-perception enough to realize that not only is he pointing out that they might be the steward, the bad stewards, or he's actually, they, they don't, they, they haven't really like, they don't, you're, you're right, they seem blinded. They're not really internalizing. I feel like they're not really internalizing the idea that he is pointing out, in fact, that they are indeed bad stewards. 
and they're not internalizing they have no idea that he's gonna wind up they don't really know that he's he's Yeshua Messiah right they just it's just they're they're in this like like Nathan just said must have been a very strange experience for them they're in the soup yeah. of like was he talking about us? I think he's talking about us. He's, is he talking about us? I think he's talking about us. Oh, God forbid that we should be such people when they are mm -hmm. already being such people. <laughs> yeah, well, the you next know? the next passage, Luke 19, actually says that they knew he was talking about them. And that's why they then they wanted to figure out a way to kill him. Right. So, Which is funny I mean, because... So yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, which is funny because by by wanting to react violently to the truth of what he said... They are fulfilling the truth of what he said. Yeah, exactly. How how crazy is that? Yeah. And they're really just they're really just trying to protect their their position. It's it's like such a hardcore. It's cognitive dissonance. Attachment to, it's cognitive dissonance. It is, yeah. but it's like they're so attached to the world, like so attached to the world, right? That and their position like their role in the world like yeah yeah i don't know it's it's it's, it's something that could totally be talked to for, about for like in my opinion for hours is to me it's this these two passages 20 and 21 are some of the most in like fascinating scriptures where yeshua is speaking in my in my opinion All right, so i'm biting my tongue but let's let's keep reading because i know we'll get to some other stuff where it's just like Yeshua just blows the mind, at least my mind, which is, you know, not saying much, let's be honest. So, uh, and she, okay, go ahead, buddy. You're, is it you sure. or me? It's, oh, uh, I, I is it just... me? I think it's no. me, right? Is it you? Okay, go. Yeah, no. it's me. Yeah, you just read the last one. Okay, go. Or, was it, or it? did I read the last one? You did. <laughs> what? Wait. No, I did. I did. No, I did. you did. You yeah. did. Okay. Oh, my God. You guys, we're, 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 I thought we're, I was, we're, we're, I thought okay. I was going crazy. Listen, only my professionals, mind. only the highest level of professionalism here at Yeshua Network, okay? We don't yeah. claim to be uh, television personalities or anything like that. We are exactly what anybody would accuse us to be, which is just two dudes on the internet having fellowship with other dudes and dudettes on the uh, internet. Okay? That's it. Guilty as charged. Mm -hmm. So, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, brother. <laughs> I can't, you can't you have coke showing? What's wrong with you? You have to cover that. Is this a product placement? Yes, you can't do... Well, not only that, but coke may be like, you have to take that video down. Oh, my God. And Seriously. then you just showed it. No, yeah, this I'm is my... This is my thing. own... No, it's not product placement. My own personal can that I have purchased uh, I'll deal for with whatever... I have to go through and CGI a coke can out of your hand. OMG. Have I'm calling that. Coke. Have a I'm, good time I'm, with that. I'm ratting on you. I'm going to say, well, Coke, whose authority did he have that Coke in his hand? And then they'll be like, nay, we know not. And I'll say, nay, then we shall neither tell you in whose authority he got that Coke product in his hand. Wow. Will that, will that That's be, um, spun out of control. Do you think they would think that weird? I think that would be weird. What I think. Just, what if you answered all people like that? You just. You know what? <laughs> this is a brilliant idea. Brilliant. This is just genius. And that, and I wonder why you're my only you're my only friend in flesh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I sometimes I wonder the same. Okay, good. Hold on, Go let ahead. me cover let me cover let me cover the see? It's oh, now a nondescript can. Okay, good. Good. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not a giant. This is a tiny can. Yes, it's a mini are. can. No, I am not. I am not nine feet tall. I I am not a nephilim. Okay, all right. Jennifer Connelly, Luke. Tw <laughs> you broke up. Do it again. Take two. Oh my goodness gracious! Okay, we're having too much fun already. What's in that coke? Here we go. Jennifer Connelly, Luke twenty twenty through twenty three. The Pharisees. Is it yeah. lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Hmm. Get a koozie, Alex. <laughs> yes. Um, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? So, uh, they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. And then they asked him, saying, Teacher, we know that you say to te and teach rightly, 
and you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Why do you test me? It's pretty mm. amazing to me that they poo-poo his authority and then are trying to catch him by pretending to be righteous and seizing him by his words to deliver him to the power and authority of the governor. Seizing the Son of God by his words. He is the living word. If this ain't controlled folly and ridiculousness on their part, I don't, I don't know what is. Um, Matthew twenty two fifteen. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Definitely two different kingdoms at play. And mm. Dina Christu says, uh, I was thinking about that too. The thing is, because they were expecting a more warrior like Messiah, they couldn't perhaps fathom or want to accept that he was in fact their Messiah. I can't help but feel for them. There, there have been many occasions in my personal life where I have been presented with the truth, but refused to believe it. I would even go out of my way to disprove that truth, just so that it would align with my belief. If mm -hmm. only they knew that Yeshua was the living word. Oh, I just got chills. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. And Lynn D says, um, what I get from this verse is that they were too blinded and stuck on what they thought they knew and perhaps prideful and arrogant, ultimately dismissing first commandment, meaning at what point did they include God in this logical process? I can mm -hmm. see this as something I can see this as something I should be aware of in my personal walk. Slow to speak, slow to anger, slow to think or have any emotional or thought of an outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This this um, you guys are awesome. This is totally true that it is in the it is in those that really struggle and fail where we can take the most warning and like self application. That's the way I feel. And that's the way I, I think we've 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 been blessed to approach our biblical studies here and our fellowship together. So many of you, Nathan, myself occasionally are reminding all of us that we should look at those that messed up and take heed not judge them because obviously it's easy to go pointing fingers at this point but to realize that whatever they were struggling with is something we know well <laughs> we struggle with the same things all the time and uh, for them the consequences were massive Mashiach is on earth and they you know, they do what they do. Um, but, um, you know, did they realize that the consequences were massive? The point is they didn't. They had no clue how massive of a consequence they were unleashing, right? Or messing with. And so that, that's the same thing. The scary part is when you, when, when, when you don't realize what's happening, how easy it is to miss something massive. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So like when Lindy, when you point out these things about being slow to speak, slow to anger, slow to think or have an emotion or th slow to have an outcome, you know, to project an outcome. Those are very wise words. Yeah, indeed. Mm. I agree. Both. Yeah. Here Peterson, Luke 20, verse 20 to 26. I just love that in this attempt to trap Yeshua and get him to choose between Rome and God. He just totally evades the trap by saying that they should give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. He even points out the image on the coin, which I don't think would have been taken very kindly by the religious Jews since they didn't make images or anything since it wasn't allowed in the law. How Yeshua avoided both encouraging the sin of making images while also avoiding bashing the Romans rule is so smart and perfect. He is so clearly God because I know I could not have come up with such a careful and intelligent answer like this. It's brilliant. Yes. He is so cool. Yeah, he really it's is. It's true. There's something, yeah, there's something else that you pointed on, which I'm glad that you talked about. Because if you do remember in the Old Testament, the coins that the Jews were told to use or the coinage in which the Jews were told to use had to be the coin that God told them to design. And the coins that are traded in the outer temple and the outer court of the temple are the Caesar coins. They're not God's coins. 
So the Jew, the, 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 the leadership of the temple themselves, by even using these coins, are actually blaspheming the temple with their presence. And they welcome it because they use it as their currency, which, remember, they're not supposed to be getting wealthy. So ironically enough, in the way that they trap him, he also points out their, the level of their sin with the coin. He says, w it's like, show me a coin. Show me a penny. And he has one on him, which according to Levitical law, he's not supposed to have. So it's a it's a like the level of the depths of what he just did to them and, and the level in which he just showed why he also flips over the tables is is just epic. Yeah, that's I actually mean, very that's actually a, a super great point, because if you think about what money really is. Money is just whatever. Mm -hmm. It's in and of itself. It's just a piece of metal or a piece of paper or whatever. It's the value that you recognize of it. So if the Jews recognized the value of Caesar's coin, well, who created the coin? Who's, whose face is on it? Well, Caesar. It's his coin. So if the Jews right. say this is worth a loaf of bread or it's worth a sacrifice in the temple, they are accepting Caesar's ownership of them essentially because the money that you use for exchange is not just enriching you and being able to allow you to exchange stuff it also is kind of enslaving you that money you're yeah. beholden to that money now so by them accepting caesar's coin by them trading caesar's coin in the temple they are they are allowing caesar to have authority over them so they thought they were, you're right, they thought they were all sneaky, 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 we're going to get him now, and he points out to the fact that they already got themselves, you know what I'm saying, they already did that to themselves, they they already accepted Caesar's coin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, deep. and it is pretty deep. The other thing is, too, is if you think about it, too, God's coin was to represent, so God gave like two different descriptions of what his coins represented in the Old Testament. Just real quick while we're on this topic, right? One coin was to represent the animal sacrifices or the value of like the grains of wheat, right? Again, these are God created things. Yeah. So what his coins represent are like the weights of measurements of, of the things they're grown, which remember is the one thing that he promised if you tithe, right, if you give your 10%, I will make sure that you will always be basically all the things that I create will always be good with you. I'll always feed you. The weather will always be good. The crops will always be good. The animals will always be good. But these are things that God created. So that was one one definition of what the coin represented for those who did not actually have the animals, right? We know that from Levitical law. The second thing that the coins represented was um, was the the – the population, which is why when when David goes to do the counting of the coins and does the tally and gets the whole thing and he doesn't act for the coins, if you remember, that got him in big, big trouble, right? So because he was breaking that Levitical law. So God's people was the other value. And so here you have the coin of Caesar and like Ricardo just wrote, which I'll, I'll put down here real quick because I, I copied it. Um, it's a very good comment. Uh, this ties in with what I, what I was going to say. In ancient Rome, not this part, but this confirms the next sentence I was going to say. In ancient Rome, after his assassination in 44 BCE, Julius Caesar was indeed deified. His adopted son and heir, Octavian, later known as Augustus, utilized his uh, defic Deification to is that deification? Excuse me, I was like defecation. That doesn't sound right. Deification to solidify his own political power. Caesar was worshipped as a divine figure in Rome religion and was given the title Divius Julius, the Divine Julius. This uh, deification was part of a broader tradition in Roman culture, where deceased emperors and uh, prominent figures were sometimes elevated to the status of gods after their deaths. So, again, like the level of the blasphemy, right, being on the, I know, <laughs> Ricardo's laughing at me because I said defecation, uh, deification, yeah. So, yeah, that points out to the other part of the, just like how by, so, so there's a thing just to be, just to give fair, I don't know why I do this every video, but to be fair to the people living in the time, they didn't exactly have a choice. The money they had to use since they were conquered 
was the Roman money system, right? So the thing that I don't think that God or that Yeshua was part of God, the thing that I do not think that Yeshua was was pointing out exactly was look at you, you sinners. But I believe he was pointing out the use of this money, the fact that they agreed to the value of what this money meant, which is according to Caesar's definition, was proof that you you're all in a mess. You've all lost what the temple's supposed to be. You have all fallen away, and none of you are able or acting in a way that is of God, right? You, you want to come at me and you want to trap me according to Levitical law and, and, you know, Torah law, right? But in reality, you yourself are breaking Torah law every day. You exchange and you buy something or you take a donation or you take a, a, a an offering, right? You are breaking Torah law. So I, I feel like what he's also pointing out too is their lack of understanding that they need grace, that which they are not showing. Right. Because Yeshua is constantly pointing out to them. He even tells us, uh, you know, that these men who are the leaders of the temple work even to take widows homes because a widow doesn't inherit her home. So they're not trying to help her out. They're not trying to help her stay in her home and provide for her kids, which they should be doing. That is also Levitical law. But instead, they work towards gathering that home and using it for their benefit. So. I think, like, I know I'm kind of running with it, but I, I, I'm i just saying, like, if being that they understand the law so well, and according to their understanding, of course, it just seems to me to be very, uh, very multi-layered what Yeshua has, what is doing with this whole coin thing. So great, just great beginning of a conversation. I'm super glad it was pointed out. So um, Sarah Live says he is pointing out that they are all high and mighty but they are not following the law perfectly themselves. Yeah. And I think he's also pointing out that they can't. And that's one of the things you hear me say on this, on this ministry page all the time, the people who come on this page or the people who show up in our feed and our videos and things like that. And they're constantly trying to be like, Oh, well, you don't follow the law. You don't follow the law. Me and my friends, we follow the law or you don't follow the law. Like it says, and you should be keeping the Torah. Like it says, and blah, 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 blah. It's like, nobody is, you know, nobody's keeping the law. And I feel like, you know, the fact that we have president faces or kings or queens faces on our money systems, uh, no matter really where you are in the world, is proof that we also are breaking the same rules, right? So, and the fact that we say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday is breaking a law, right? So it's like, you know, the calendar we keep is breaking Torah law. So nobody is keeping the Torah law. And I just think like it's so wonderful that yeshua himself in these scriptures is like pointing out you're not even close to keeping the laws in which you are claiming to be keepers of right so it's just i just don't think that he's just picking on them i think he's also trying to show them that they themselves are in need of grace and that they themselves if they can look at the fact that they are nowhere close to being perfect and the only reason I say this, I guess I, I got to finish this thought. The only reason I say this is, is we talked my brother had mentioned the word cognitive dissonance. Other people in the live feed so far in the conversation have mentioned how the Pharisees and Sadducees, they, 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 they're, they're blinded to who Yeshua is and they want him to ride in on the horse and be the Messiah Ben David version, the warrior version of Messiah. And we can all sit here and say like, what's going on with them? Why don't they get it? Which we all have had this conversation like every video for the last like two months because this is the talk we're on in the scriptures. But it's like, I feel that it's super applicable to us today too. And I feel like, like we, we so do the exact same thing. And, uh, and I just think that like, um, if they, if we, if, if the, I perceive, this is my own opinion. I perceive that if the Sadducees and Pharisees and the, and the temple leaders were to acknowledge that their system that God called them to is so out of reach for them, then they would understand why what Yeshua is doing matches the Messiah. That's the point I want to get to. By him pointing out the coin, 
it shows them that they are so far removed from the from the Torah law that they 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 even carry idols in their pockets. They're so removed from the law that they need grace and their system is so broken they can't escape it because if they don't use that money, they get thrown in prison and their families starve. The same thing that they end up doing to the widows. And, and and so like for us today, I feel like we should be understanding that we are no better than the Pharisees and Sadducees. So many Christians, they think, well, I have the blood of God and I don't need to do animal sacrifices and I don't need to do this and that. And I'm righteous and I'm holy because the Holy Spirit makes me so. Well, that's right. But th- but we are also totally sinning all the time. And as much grace as we don't even understand that we need a daily dose of from the, like I said, the money we have in our pockets to the fact that we say, hey, I'll, uh, let's have a meeting on Tuesday. Every time we say a weekday, we're saying the name of a, of a Greek or Roman god. You know, um, it, every time we say the name of a month, we're saying the name of, of, of a deity or some figure rooted in a deity. Right. There's so many things that we are doing that are literally God said never do. And so I just I, I guess I'm just pointing this out because this is such a relevant thing to, I think, for us believers, as we move into end times, let's just say that we can become we might become holy rolling. We might be filled with the Holy Ghost. And we might we might feel ourselves becoming like righteous. And uh, and and uh, if we just like stay in the mindset of. Uh, I live in a system that it's almost like I'm forced to sin. And I pray, at least me personally, I pray that God shows me perpetual grace because I know that I'm sinning in these things. And yet I still do them because I don't know another way to go about it. And to me, that seems like exactly what the Pharisees are doing. I think that that's exactly what he was pointing out about the coin that they keep in their pocket. Anyways, I think I beat the horse to death here in my point, but it's just so perfect analogy of like how sin skips by and thereby grace and the need for mercy skips by. And also that points out exactly who Yeshua is. If they understood how far away they were from God, they would understand why Yeshua, you know, Ben Yosef version was what they actually needed. So anyways, done with my rant. That's a very, that's a very, very, very powerful point. I think it's true. Um, they were drowning in all the things that the law, like you said, told them not to do. They were drowning essentially in, in sin. Um, the world we live in, if you were really to, <laughs> if you were to really think about deeply or even somewhat deeply about all the things that we do every day that we are involved with, that we hear, that we talk about, the way we talk about things, um yeah just head knee deep whatever head deep in sin um we we absolutely do need yeshua desperately um they did too and they did not realize how sinful they were perhaps if they realized that they would have realized that they need him desperately yeah I feel like that's the thing they really they really missed is that is and it it's not just that they were holding on to their position in the world and they were holding on to the world. It's just like they they knew the Bible so well or their version, the Torah, the Tanakh, things like that. They knew it so well. And they couldn't even see that they were breaking more than half the rules themselves just by it's it's quite possible in the world. that it's quite possible that they had a relativistic view, meaning, okay, well, Yes, we do all these things, but like the Romans openly worship, they they, have, they constantly engage in, you know, let's just say all kinds of sexual sins, they sure. do this and that. Sure. So they would relative, they would judge the nations around them or the nation particularly that was oppressing them. And they would say, well, how can we possibly be compared to the Romans? Uh, this is ridiculous. We are so much more godly. And... Um, yeah, that's 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 well, that's, base, that, that's that that's the very point I'm making though. Yeah, is like exactly. they they were like, well, I don't worship the person on the coin, but there's nowhere in the Bible where you know it says that. Okay, but even if you don't worship the idol, you're not allowed to have it in your tent, 
right? The guy right. had the idols, the wooden idols in his tent. Him and his whole family had to be burned to death. There's nowhere in the Bible where it tells us the guy was setting them up at night and like worshiping them. He just had them. Maybe he had, maybe like his great friend made them for him when he was a kid. Maybe he made them when he was a kid. Maybe he had some kind of emotional attachment to it. But the mere fact that they were there was worthy of death for him and his family. You know what I'm trying to say? So, yeah, it's like, yeah, that, that's the point you're making is the very point I'm, I'm making too for us. It's just like, we, I believe that we think that we are so much like we are righteous and good in our ways. And there's just so many things that we don't realize we're messing up on. And, and you know, I have to go on a tiny little thing here. It's, I know that I pull, point out in this ministry, a lot of basically like this, like, like sinful things, right? Like the, how I sin a lot and people are like, well, what do you do? And it's like, well, what do I not do? And it's like, and then people are like, oh, you beat yourself up. You're too hard on yourself. And I'm, I might be, I might be, I did, I did get that vibe from the, from the dream that I had recently with Yeshua visit, visiting me that I, I'm a little hard on myself, but but the thing is that I, I realized from my dream was that Yeshua was demonstrating this unbelievable grace and that he himself fixes everything. And therefore, I can't be uppity on myself. But if I acknowledge those things that are my sins, then I can understand the value of that amazing grace he shows. Like, exactly. I think it's one thing for us to raise our hands and sing the song, Amazing Grace. But then the more that we are aware of the things that we do against him— and against others, right? The more we're aware, sure, we can beat ourselves up, which is not biblical either, but also just, I feel that he who is forgiven much loves much, right? So I guess I, I sound a little bit more like a negative-minded kind of, or a negative-sided, you know, minister, if you will. Such a weird sentence for me to say, but a negative-minded minister rather than like all the happy, go, go good, fluffy side of things. But I feel like to me, the negative things that I see about myself, the places where I am shortcoming and weak, it's like those are the things where I'm, I perceive the amazing grace of God, which is why as soon as I start usually talking about my salvation and what Christ did and how he still loves me and it blows my mind, I begin to like get emotional and want to cry happy tears. It's like because I am very I try to perpetually stay on that mindset. I had to run off on that tangent because I guess I'm speaking kind of to the to this ministry uh, since we're making a video within this ministry uh, about how like I am self aware of of how I sound possibly a lot negative when I point out those things, but I also think that they're not really negative when you understand what the totality of them pointing out is is the grace of Christ, right? So, anyways, that that was I just wanted to for the record. So, go ahead. Move on, brother. Read the next one for me. Yeah, no, I just, I, but this is important, um, important conversation. And, uh, you know, yeah. So, I, I, I don't consider that conversation a tangent. I, I consider it right on topic. Just saying. Um, I think it might be you. You might be, yes. You do, Sarah. Uh, you do Sarah, and then I'll 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 take Ricardo's because it's long. Well, I just ranted. Why don't you take the next one? Okay. Oh, um, oh I'll yeah, do Ricardo's. Yeah. Okay, huh? I'll do Ricardo's. That's what no, you're no. saying. No, I'll I'll do Ricardo's. You do Sarah's because it's shorter, and then oh, and then I'll I do thought Ricardo's. we did it. Oh, did you just do oh, that? No? One? no, I wasn't. I did. Oh. I did Jennifer Connolly's. So you're you're Sarah's. Oh. All right. See you guys. Like I said, super professional here. Sarah Peterson, Luke 20, verse 20 through 26. I just, 26. I just love that in this attempt to trap Yeshua and get him to choose between Rome and God, he just totally evades the trap by saying that they should give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Yeah, this is exactly what I just, this was a conversation that I just, we just went on a tangent of. I know, but it's so, just, it's just he's, I've already read it is what I'm saying. You did? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Oh, That's okay. why, because I, I put Ricardo's comment See, underneath. So we're just, confusion so is right. yeah. our, our main uh, course here. Yeah. Uh, who's so, on first? For, All right. So then I'll read Ricardo's. And then I'll, yes. read, I'll read the comments on the Ricardo's, so it'll break it up. How's that? Okay. Well, I, I'm cool with, you know, I'm cool with getting through the whole thing and then 
you know, because you just, you like you said, whatever you want to do. Okay, Ricardo, Luke 20. Here we go. Yes, Sarah confirmed we already read it. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, Luke 20, 33-36. Asking Yeshua about resurrection and whose wife was from all husbands she had. I made a comment on Matthew and Mark about the situation. I remember the first times I read the Bible, these verses always left me quite puzzled, especially in Mark and Matthew, which say exactly the same thing. But Luke provides a clarification that, sh that sheds light on the matter. At least that was my experience reading the Bible several times. So let me share. Matthew and Mark wrote, In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? Um, for the seven had her to wife. Yeshua answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are the angels which are in heaven, but are as the angels which are in heaven. Luke recounts the situation a bit less confrontational regarding the scriptures and rephrases it like this. The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they who shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto angels and are the children of God being the children of the resurrection. My reading of this is basically that after the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage because they cannot die anymore. Marriage is under the law, as the phrase goes, until death do us part. If we no longer die, it would be an eternal marriage. And besides, uh, but no less important, we're already committed to Yeshua. Paul made reference to this writing. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no longer she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Yeshua, that you shall that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we are in flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And he also wrote, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corrupt it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Reading this from Paul left me with this thought. We die to the law through the body of Yeshua so that we may belong to Yeshua itself, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. A mirror of what will come in the resurrection. We die in the body and sin is buried with it. Now, did you think that was all my comment? <laughs> here comes the PS. If you want to take a break here, it's not a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> ra wrapping up the comment. PS, what if? I was left thinking about verse 36 where it says, For they are equal unto angels, and are the children of God being the children of the resurrection. The perspective of the sentence and the response is based on the question about how it will be in the resurrection. They can't die anymore, um, equal to angels, children of God, children of the resurrection. But if you turn the tables in perspective, it's also saying that angels can't die anymore, that they are children of God and children of the resurrection. The Bible doesn't talk about this, so pay attention. Rabbit hole approaching. What if, what if in this sentence Yeshua is giving a hint about the origin of the angels and messengers? What if they went through the same process as us? I don't like that word, process, but I couldn't find another one. I mean, maybe, Father, forgive me if I'm being heretical, in a galaxy far, far away, 
<laughs> one of the 100 billion possible in the observable universe. There was a planet where things didn't go as haywire as ours, and its residents maintained a direct relationship with the creator. And I don't want to go off on a tangent. It looks like a pretty deep rabbit hole. I have a quite a laborious rabbit in my brain. Can you capture the essence of this thought more or less? It's an interesting thought, Ricardo. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, Sarah Peterson says, I don't think it's heretical to think about the possibility that angels have a whole backstory that we don't know about. I think a lot about how here's, there's probably so much we don't know about that we will someday get to learn. I guess in my mind right now, it makes sense to me that we are at least a bit different from the angels in that, in that when God created us in Genesis, he made a point to say that we were created in his image. It also seems that we have something that the enemy is jealous of or doesn't like, even if it's just God's love for us. Definitely interesting to consider. And Ricardo responds and says, Yes, indeed, Genesis says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Don't want to bring on any debate because we already talked about this in the first videos. I totally recommend to check for the original language of the word God, the word image, the word likeness. In Hebrew, changes a little. It seems to have a bigger or broader meaning. For example, in mm -hmm. Genesis, it is mentioned Elohim, but not Yehovah Elohim. As in future scriptures, the term Elohim is a Hebrew word that is used in the Bible to refer to God, particularly in the Old Testament. It is a plural noun, but is often used with singular verbs and adjectives when referring to the God of Israel, indicating a majestic or plural form of God. In some contexts within the Bible, Elohim can refer to other divine beings or spiritual entities, but these instances are relatively rare compared to its predominant use as a name of the God of Israel. However, in some religious traditions and belief systems, particularly within certain interpretations of Kabbalah and other mystical Jewish teachings, Elohim has been understood in a broader sense, sometimes representing a divine family or hierarchy of spiritual beings. In these interpretations, Elohim can encompass various levels of divine manifestation. Not in vain, there is a psalm which Yeshua quotes, in which it says, You are Elohim, children of the Most High. So while Elohim primarily refers to God in the Judeo-Christian tradition, interpretations may vary, and in some contexts it should be understood in a broader familial or hierarchical sense with certain religious frameworks within yeah within certain religious frameworks yep and uh sarah says ricardo oh right i've actually heard this interpretation of elohim it is uh as in it is referring to the divine council of jehovah which is why it is said let us make man in our image so interesting you bring up a great point perhaps we're more similar to angels than we traditionally think but what about in the New Testament when it says that we as humans will someday judge angels? Yeah. That makes it seem like we're somehow superior to them if we will be judging them. And uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 3, Sarah continues, uh, is the reference for the judging angels, by the way. And Ricardo says, Sarah, not sure if superior, but apparently a position of authority or significance in the spiritual realm. And Sarah says, yes, I think superior was a strong word that I used there, LOL. I immediately regretted it. Either way, Thanks. I know it is a rabbit hole and probably not really an EBRT conversation, but I'm enjoying it. Thanks, brother. We love. I you think guys. it's very much. We a, love you guys. Uh, yeah, me too. I, I love this conversation. I, I love all these conversations. I love that we can have these conversations. That's, what, that's for me. That's exactly what I love about EBRT. Is that one? We ask where having hundreds of people all around the world actually read the Bible and gain understanding, but a lot of that has to do with the fact that we converse about what it is we're reading. And uh, yeah, I think I think this was a very good testimony of what it's like on EBRT when a rabbit hole gets chased. I think it's great. I think it's a wonderful thing. Yep. Uh, Jennifer calling Luke 20 through 34. Why would the Sadducees ask a question about resurrection if they don't believe in it? Uh, Luke 20, 34, Yeshua answered and said unto them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age and that resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore. For they are equal to the angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. This answer is amazing, and apparently Yeshua believes in the resurrection, but 
were they spiritually dead or just blinded? I think he was sassing them too with the answer because they didn't ask any more questions after that one. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live under him. Yeah, the, knowing that the Sadducees don't believe in the Messiah and the resurrection and all the spiritual wooey wooey stuff is, I think, super important. I, I, it's, it's interesting to me, too, how many actual Christians on planet Earth do not understand the actual difference of what Sadducee and Pharisee actually means. Most Christians think Pharisee just means religious hypocrite. Uh, and that's not what the word Pharisee means, right? So not not according to the Bible. So uh, having that understanding, I think, is awesome when you do read Luke 20, 34, because, yeah, you end up realizing he's like, you don't know the scriptures. Why are you even trying to go this route? And it also shows the level of which they were trying to like, like how horribly they were faking their knowledge and their respect of him on the topic. Like they're just they're basically totally just giving him lip service. And it's like so obvious because they don't even believe in this. So they don't even know how to talk about it. If anything, it shows too how they make fun of it. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Which is, a, it, it gives an additional wonderful depth in my, in my opinion of, of the scriptures when you read these parts and you're like, yeah, they didn't believe. No wonder he responds like that to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I can read this next one, dude, since you had a long one just now. So Go for it. Uh, Luke 20, this is Sarah Peterson, Luke 20, verse 41 through 44. Then Yeshua said to them, why is it said that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The verse always breaks my brain. Yeshua is quoting from Psalms 110. Here is the passage. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle, array in holy splendor. Your young men will come to you like dew from the morning womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations heaped up the, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. I guess this passage has confused me because I don't understand how David knew that the Messiah would be Yahweh himself coming in flesh. He knew that the promise was given to his own descendant, the son of David. But somehow David must have known what it would also that it would also be God. Or why would he have said, the Lord says to my Lord, which I looked up in the Strongs, and the first Lord is Jehovah in Hebrew, and the second Lord is Adonai, and could denote a human or divine ruler. But either way, David is addressing his descendants as Lord, which means he knows that they are greater than himself. Do you all think that David knew that the Messiah would be God, or do you think he was speaking in the spirit and didn't understand exactly what he said? I guess it doesn't matter either way, but it's interesting. I agree with you. I'm just going to say before we read, I'm persuaded David knew, but we'll get to that in a second, if, if need be. Uh, Ricardo says, therapy said, not sure if David knew or not with fully understanding, but surely Matthew 22 and Mark 12 agree that David said that in by the spirit. David was recognized as king and prophet. Uh, Sarah Peasons, that's right. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. I guess it doesn't say whether or not David had understanding when he spoke by the spirit. But either way, it was the spirit saying those words through David so that we would have understanding. Yes, that's awesome. Sarah Lewis Robinson said, replies to Sarah as well. It messed with my head a bit as well. Yeshua being the descendant of David, but also knew David before he was born. I started to think the same about Mary. Imagine creating your own mom, but that's also his daughter, right? These are the kind of nighttime thoughts you get before you go to sleep. Indeed, indeed, Sharon. Lindy also replies to Sarah, says, yes, me too. This verse trips me out too. This verse was discussed in previous EBRT and with great explanation where I could finally understand it, but I don't know how but I don't know which book and chapter, Matthew, perhaps. 
to your question about King David, check out this chapter in Acts 2, 29 through 30. Brothers, I must say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried in his tomb is and his tomb is with us to this day, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. Uh, Bob uh, replies to Sarah as well. There are so many parallelisms and analogies in scripture and in our own personal lives, the illuminate the intricate details of God's relationship with us and our relationship with him. Even the perfect testimony of love he displayed by going on going to the cross for us. That is missed by so many religious by so many religious ones that only view it as a business transaction. Sarah replies to Bob says, wow, thank you. Or, or replies to everybody. Excuse me. She says, wow, thanks to each of you for your insights. I love our EBRT group so much. Everyone, con Everyone's contribution is just amazing. Well, I am in agreement with you on that one, Sarah, and with uh, everybody else's comments. They are amazing. You guys are great. This is, again, just to give you guys praise because I love to do so. Uh, such a great group. Um, yeah, so – I'm going to chime in just with the reason why I think David understood that who he was is because of the uh, of the prophecy in the Garden of Eden that uh, the son, uh, which will be born without the male seed, uh, will bruise his heel upon the serpent's head. Right. So that to me is a is a messiah. Uh, and if he has no earthly father, then I believe that the. People who studied the Bible and really understood it, which I think David definitely did, um, because he was allowed to eat the showbread and also is from the his priesthood is of the Melchizedek priesthood, which means that he dealt directly with God, right? Like that's what that means. He wasn't limited to the the Torah Levitical laws. God had anointed him and said, "You are a priesthood unto me personally," which is why I think David danced naked, right? It's not because he was a lunatic. <laughs> but because he had that kind of real relationship with God. That, that's just my persuasion. But I do believe that in that, David would have read the scriptures, studied the scriptures, and he, especially as king, I, I do believe that he would know the prophecy of the Messiah, and I believe that it would be revealed to him. Uh, and and there's, there's no one in the scripture that says that he says that, except for the fact that he says, my Lord... To, he's saying that his descendant will be his Lord, right? So so we could say, well, did David know? Does he ever really say? Yeah, he says his descendant is his Lord. So to me, that is the proof that he knew the Messiah was a manifestation of God in flesh, that his father had to be God himself. And there's a certain terminology throughout the Bible for if God directly created you, whether you were an angel or whether you were Adam or whether you're Messiah, you are a son of God. Right. Sons of God. Right. That's the terminology that they use. And that's also why I believe that Yeshua constantly refers to himself as son of uh, Adam, son of man. And why that particular passage and why that particular phrase pisses off the Pharisees and Sadducees so much is because they know he is referring to the prophecy of bruise the heel upon the serpent's head. Son. So it's not it's not like a, a thing that they're confused about, specifically for sure the Pharisees. Maybe the Sadducees are confused because they don't believe in that. But the Pharisees believe in that. And we're going to get into that, too, in this video tonight, I believe, if we keep going on time that we are. So I am persuaded that David knew that the Messiah was coming from his bloodline and that to be Messiah meant that he was born of a virgin. And that way he would be perfectly in sin. And that is how he would be the blemish free lamb. So, and that he would bruise his heel upon the serpent's head. So I, I that, that's my own persuasion. Nobody else has to be persuaded. I'm not trying to convince anybody. I'm just saying that that's my two cents. So, yeah. Did David dance awesome. naked or with a loincloth? Okay. He might've danced, you know, with a loincloth, but there are the English version says he danced naked and they were like, Hey, put something on. So, but if technically if he's in his own private, his own private tent or whatever, his own private space. He can dance naked if he wants. <laughs> it's just, you know, you can be weird for God, I suppose. So yeah. Isn't Daniel seven the Son of Man reference? Uh, it's one of them. There's a few of them. Yeah, there's there's 
there's two other sons of men that I remember. Daniel was one, I believe, and Ezekiel. I believe. Yeah, and then, well, and then Job, right? I don't know. Was Job called son of man? No, he wasn't. But the angels, when they gathered and then Satan showed up. Remember when God says, you know, come up angels and then Satan decided to go to and he's like, what are you doing here? And he's just like, well, I want to talk to you about your people, you know. And I believe that when it talks about the gathering, it doesn't say that the gathering of the angels. I don't believe it said that. I believe it says like the gathering of the sons of men or something like that. So that's how we know it was like angels. No, sons I might of be God, wrong. sons of God. Those were the, sons the of God. Job and somewhere in Genesis, I think maybe even oh, Genesis 6, it was sons of God. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that, that's the term. So the was. angels are sons of God, but then yeah. Daniel, oh, Ezekiel, and Yeshua are oh. son of man. My bad, my bad. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. I, I, I was thinking in my head, sons of God. That yeah. was my terminology. But yes, gotcha. they're asking or talking about sons of man. My bad. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool beans. All right. But, but even though it's not said to be, they don't use the word son of man in the garden prophecy. It does say your, your son will, you will have, a, you, you will have a son that will bruise his heel upon the serpent's head. Right. Yeah. So, that's why I'm saying that there, that whole thing about him constantly referencing himself to being the son of Adam and not, not the son of David. Like there are people, by the way, the, who's the, who's the person was it, a blind person who says, son of David, heal me. And then the apostles are like, Hey, shut up, shut up, shut up. Cause they're like not trying to bring attention to the Messiah-ness of Yeshua. So he doesn't get captured. At least that's my persuasion. Um, Right? Like, why Why would they tell him to be quiet and stuff? And why does Yeshua keep telling everybody to be quiet? Like, don't don't tell anybody. It's because he doesn't want to cause more havoc on him and his apostles until the right time. But, so we do know that the son of David is a Messiah figure, obviously, but also the son of Adam, or man, which Adam, they would say, he would say Adam. The son of Adam prophecy or terminology is definitely like the, uh, the uh, reference uh, you know, to Messiahhood. Come to, to the think Jews. of it come to think of it the son of adam the son of david would be a messiah for the jews the right. son of adam would be a messiah for humanity the world exactly exactly yeah so i think i think maybe he comes as quote unquote son of david as a second coming right for his because he's now he's just coming for the for his yeah. people because yeah, he, Messiah, well, he even says that I come from my bride. Yeah, son of son of man, son of Adam, Messiah saves from sin because that's yeah. sin is what we need saving from from the original right. sin. Right. And son of David, Messiah saves Israel. Exactly. Yeah, Sarah Peterson wrote that too, dude. Look at that. You guys are on the same. Yeah. You're on the same chapter here. You're on the same page. I love it. Exactly, dude. All right. Wow. Snap. Oh, <laughs> snap. Yep. That's right. That was crazy. I wasn't even looking on your uh, uh, on the feed right now. This group is, Bam. This group is bomb dot com. This group is the bomb dot com. OK, OK. I'm not trying to vote because I'm not boasting about me. I'm boasting about our, the group, right? Yeah. In the comments live, whether you're watching this live or recorded, but in the comments, I said comments live, but in the comments live and also recorded. I. I if you go to a church or have you heard this this kind of thing explained in your church, like this is so important to me. Like to me, I love this conversation. I love the defining of these terms and these understandings because I know that when I read the Bible the first time, for sure, the second time things got a little bit more clear, thank God to the Strong's Concordance. But like I was reading these things and I was like, man, they have this guy has so many nicknames. And that's all that I thought they were. I thought they were nothing more than just like kind of terms of uh, endearment. Right. But then as you begin to study what these mean, they're not just terms of endearment. They are they are literal life descriptions of his place in creation and his yeah. role in our eternity and souls. Right. Like that's why to me it's so wonderful. And I just think like There's just, just a praise report for exactly. Oh, There's and real shame. quick. Uh just to say that, you know, I, I mentioned before, too, because Elohim and Adonai were brought up. Uh, Adonai is usually referenced God because they would never say Yahweh. Elohim can just mean like a chief or great leader, 
But if it was Yahweh Elohim, then obviously they would be saying the great I am that I am God. Yeah. So anyways, I just because so I was I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, my 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 leader, my chief, my leader, my. You know, so if they're but no, I know, but the... I'm saying that the Jews use that specifically for Yahweh. They don't yes. really throw that around for like their brother or their friend or their general yes. or you know what i'm trying to say but they do use elohim for a governor or a judge or... oh i got you okay I'm, that's I, I, i'm I just trying to, to clarify that yeah, because yeah. there might be somebody watching who wasn't with us in the old testament that's got it, got it. Absolutely. yeah because yeah. um, that was brought up earlier so anyways yeah it's not super important because we already covered it but i just thought i'd cover it for new people okay super great uh you're ricardo brother luke 20 yep and ricardo shout out to your quick comment earlier from earlier uh about Nephilim. Uh, I made a joke. I'm not a Nephilim. And you said, you mean tyrants? And then you had a bunch of funny faces because you're right. In the Old Testament, we covered that, that the word Nephilim is misused or misinterpreted to just mean giants. And that's right. not correct. That Nephilim doesn't just mean giants. Nephilim actually more specifically means the fallen ones. And, and those who and caused evil those two falls. Yes. And the actual yeah. word in Hebrew for giants only is Rephaim. And I should have right. said refine. So as soon as I said Nephilim, I thought to myself, I should have said refine. But Nephilim is such a popular word. I thought the joke worked better with the word Nephilim. Explanation over. Thank you. <laughs> you did right. great. You did great. I did see that comment <laughs> earlier. I meant to say it, but it slipped my mind. So good, yeah. good work there, bud. Yeah, absolutely. Ricardo, uh, Luke 20, 41 through 44. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Yeshua asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Hold on real quick. Hold on. So, so Ricardo has a great comment in lieu of what we're talking about. Yeah. And then they also did include the word Hashem yes. for his name because it means the name. So, but that, but that, that, I love that you brought that up, Ricardo, because it proves my point that they considered the name, the word, the verbiage Yahweh or Yahweh, right? To be so holy that they won't ever really say it because it's only supposed to be said in the Holy Holies by the high priest or in like teachings, like privately, but they won't, they won't, they won't say it because they revere it so much that they have these other words like Adonai or the name or the I am that I am is also kind of like that. But that of course is the given name of God. Right. But it's just like, it's just so awesome that like, that's how they reference him. They're like, Oh, the name, you know, the one name, the name above all names, which is like, just ties in with so much. So I love that. Yeah. Okay. Now go back and we so good. Yep. Um, Ricardo, Luke 20, 41 through 44. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Yeshua asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Then they say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is, Jesus, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man... From that day forth, ask him any more questions. I love this part. Actually, the whole chapter, it is priceless. Same as in Matthew 22, where Yeshua stands stoically, three rounds of people coming at him, um, uh, sent with a specific task to trap Yeshua in his own words, with captious questions, to legally catch him, and with witnesses. I use the word stoically because I really like the definition of it. Stoically is an adverb that comes from the philosophy of stoicism it's all about keeping calm and composed even in tough times by suppressing mm. emotions and accepting things as they come since they're seen as inevitable parts of nature so when someone behaves stoically it means that yeshua here is handling things with a sense of calmness and resilience no matter how challenging the situation may be or how many people are watching so yeshua here in luke 20 takes some punches from chief priests and scribes and elders luke 20 1 through 8 they questioned yeshua about his authority asking him by which authority he's doing these things and who had given them this authority um uh, pharisees and herodians in luke 20 20 through 26 they asked yeshua whether it was lawful to pay taxes to caesar trying to trap him in his response and then the sadducees verses 27 through 40 they questioned yeshua about the resurrection presenting a hypothetical scenario about a woman who had been married to seven brothers. But what I love the most is when Yeshua asks them a question. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? This made them stop asking him questions. As I read this, they, they had two choices to reply. 
on one hand, they had the second Lord in Psalms 110 isn't the son of David. Therefore, David is an idolater. And on the other hand, they had David calls the Messiah his Lord because the Messiah is God. For context, in Psalm 110, David refers to the Messiah as his Lord, which implies a position of authority or superiority. According to Pharisaic beliefs, the Messiah was expected to be a descendant of David, who will bring about a messianic age characterized by peace, justice, and the ingathering of the Jewish exiles. But here, David acknowledges the Messiah as his superior, indicating a spiritual relationship beyond mere ancestry. Yeshua's question challenges the Pharisees to reconsider their understanding of the Messiah's nature and role. By asking how David could call the Messiah his Lord if he were merely his son, Yeshua is suggesting that the Messiah is more than just a descendant of David. He holds a divine status. His challenge, this challenges the Pharisees' traditional beliefs and forces them to rethink their interpretation of Scripture. Furthermore, suggesting that David, a revered figure in Jewish history, could be considered an idolater for referring to the Messiah as his Lord, when the Messiah was considered merely human, would have been highly controversial and unsettling for the Pharisees. They had deeply ingrained beliefs about David's righteousness and the nature of the Messiah, presenting a theological dilemma that they may have struggled to reconcile within their traditional framework. Yeshua here just trolled them into the next aeon, my Lord is beyond, you just can't not be in love with him. Yes, amen, absolutely. Um, yeah. The only, the only thing I want to say is a great comment, awesome comment, and it, everything you wrote makes sense, Ricardo, and it, it's still applicable for sure. But he wasn't saying it to the Pharisees. He was saying it to the Sadducees, the group that doesn't believe in the Messiah. So, yes, I believe that the Pharisees obviously had to have exactly what you said, which is a revamp of their idea of the Messiah. But in this particular situation, it's a continuation. I know it starts with a chapter in most book, whose son is the Christ. But it says, and he said unto them, it's a continuation of the story that that he's talking about that it starts in uh, 2027 and they get, and they came on to him certain of the sadducees and he points out which deny that there is any resurrection and they ask him so the the point that he says about the, the fact that they point out that they deny that there is any resurrection is the part where the bible actually tells the sadducees were not believers in the messiah and in all the hocus the, the spiritual i don't want to say hocus pocus but like the spiritual magical side of the messiah story like that was their whole thing like the, like they didn't believe in any of kind of like the miracle things they kind of wrote it off as like lore or fairy tale for uh you know educational purposes they didn't really think that it was legit they were very much like the world is tangible and they would have been like a scientific minded kind of non-spiritual minded kind of group so and they were the ones that were in charge of the sanhedrin at the time too so uh anyways i just wanted to point that out just for anybody also watching the videos so but the comment still applies like whether you're talking about the pharisees or the sadducees yes the way that yeshua taught and the things that he said was was challenging both of their views on the messiah indeed so yeah Where you at, Alex? You all right? Yeah. Uh, uh, a time will come when I want to talk about some of the things I feel are being revealed about the nature, or not the nature, but like the, the mystery of Yeshua, Yehovah. But I'm not ready to talk about that yet. But I feel like something is brewing. Um, cool. Awesome. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. That's a weird thing to say on video, but um, that's what's happening with my face at the moment. <laughs> um, so, are we ready for 21? Hold on, Ricardo's telling us to read Matthew 22, 41 to 42.
Yeah. Are you saying for us to read it, Ricardo? Oh, I'm looking at Luke. No wonder that doesn't make sense. Okay, so you're saying that possibly in Matthew 22, he tells the same story and he says he's speaking that to the uh, Pharisees? What I'm assuming you're going with this. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Yeshua asked them, saying, what you think ye the Christ? How do they... Oh, yeah, you're right. Well, even more importantly, so it's a good thing you pointed that out. Thank you very much uh, for Matthew, because there's a part two that's not in Luke, which, which, okay, so uh, thank you. You totally corrected me there. Awesome. I appreciate it. So Matthew 22, 34 says, but when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silent, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is greater commandment in the law? Uh, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. And then they said, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Yeshua asked them, say, saying, what think ye of Christ whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. He said unto them, how then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then called him Lord, how is it his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day ask for him any more questions okay cool so thank you buddy appreciate that well done i'm glad you corrected me on that too that's good but so for anybody who is reading luke because they blend right in those two passages um you probably would have thought the same thing as me that he's speaking to the sadducees which would have made sense but as i said too uh your comment does apply to both sadducee and pharisee for sure so of course it would apply to the sadducees who don't even believe in the messiah so your application is is good. So thanks, buddy. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, okay, general comments for twenty one. Um, uh, Just one, yeah. You want to read that one? No, you go sorry. ahead. Okay, Ricardo, Luke twenty one, general comment. Reading Luke twenty one made me also look into Matthew twenty four and Mark thirteen which spoke about the same situation. Exploring Luke 21 alongside its parallels in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 unveils Yeshua's discourse. These chapters serve as a dual revelation, providing insights into the impending destruction of Jerusalem, while also illuminating the signs of the end times. In Matthew and Mark, it is presented as a more blended speech in which it's hard to dissect which is talking about what, in Luke, I've noticed that uh, it is more structured and there's a separation in the events of warnings regarding the events leading to the 6770 war, glimpses of the eschatological significance of these events, and the cautionary tales about false messiahs, but also about end times. About end times, verses 7, 11, 7 through 11, 25 through 27, speak of signs in the heavens, cosmic disturbances, and the coming of the Son of Man, indica indicative of the end times. About the events of 67 to 70 AD, Siege of Jerusalem and Destruction of the Temple, verses 20 through 24 depict the Siege of Jerusalem and the ensuing desolation, along with instructions for fleeing the city. About false messiahs before 67 to 70 AD, Yeshua warns about false messiahs in verses 8 through 9, cautioning his followers not to be deceived by those claiming to be the Christ. Additionally, verses uh, 12 through 19 describe persecution, betrayal, and hardships that his disciples would face, including being brought before authorities and put to death. These warnings align with the tumultuous period leading up to the events of 67 to 70 AD. For me, the teachings in Luke 21, Matthew 24, and Mark 13 blend prophecies about the immediate concerns of Yeshua's disciples with broader insights into the future. They offer guidance for navigating the challenges of their time while also providing timeless principles for believers in every age. It seems that it will be one of those mirrored situations in the Bible, which talks about future events and also foreshadows end times. Reflecting on these passages reminds me of the relevance of Yeshua's words and the certainty of his promises. As we discern the signs of the times and anticipate his return, may we remain steadfast in faith, vigilant against deception, and anchored in the hope of his coming kingdom. Amen. Amen. 
in many men agree with you on that. Definitely has a double double application almost all the time. Pretty awesome. Uh, all right, kicking it off, Luke 21. We're making good time. You guys did a great job. Luke 21, uh, two through four. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. It was her willingness and faith that God would provide for her. It's very beautiful, her generosity to the Lord. This is interesting cross reference here about the willing mind. Second Corinthians eight twelve. For if there be first a willing mind, it is acceptable according to that a man hath and not according to that he hath not. But for I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their wants, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there be equality, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that hath gathered much had nothing over, and he that hath gathered little had no lack. Amen, amen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ricardo, I do not have that comment. Mary made a comment for Luke 21 at last minute. Maybe you didn't get to it. I don't know. Um, did you grab Maybe. it? Maybe. It might be the one that we're at right now. Luke, there... Mary, Rainey, Luke 21, 5 through 28. Oh, I don't have about to read. I... No, my next, comment, my next comment is Sharon Lewis Roberts. What? Yeah. Uh, weird okay i don't have uh i don't have a ton left actually no there's not a whole bunch left well if you Especially have mary's comment mary. if you have mary i'll read it yeah it. that's just yeah. weird that you don't have it i just hope that you have the other ones okay if not then i'll well, i'll read it that's okay all right mary ray luke 21 5 through 28 like Ricardo, I also reread the parallel chapters of Matthew 24 and Mark 13 with this one in Luke 21, where Yeshua is telling his disciples of the things to come from their immediate future all the way until the end of time. The order of the events and statements pretty well matches up in all three versions. So I feel this gives a pretty solid chronological order of events since there are three witnesses all basically saying the same thing. They are all quoting Yeshua and in all three versions, Everything is happening in the same order. The first thing that is prophesied by Yeshua is the destruction of the second temple, which happens in 70 AD. Nathan referred to it in last week's video. There was also a warning from Yeshua not to be deceived and a warning about the false Christ and Messiah that would come in that time, which Ricardo gave evidence of in the last video as well. So these things have already happened. Then Yeshua says that there is a period of wars and rumors of wars in which he says these things must come, but the end is not yet. There could have been referring to the war that brought about the destruction of the temple, or it could be the many other wars that took place after that and continue to take place until today. He also says there would be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Nothing new under the sun here. There's been going on, that's been going on in the world ever since then. This is just the beginning of sorrows, as Yeshua puts it. Then Yeshua describes the persecution that will take place, such as being hated by men, being imprisoned, being put to death, being betrayed, going before councils and rulers and testifying to them. The disciples did all of that in their lifetime, lifetimes, and persecutions have continued of this sort since that time in various parts of the world. During this period, Yeshua says that the kingdom will be preached throughout all the world. That started when the disciples received and followed the Great Commission, and the Great Commission is still taking place here 2,000 years later. So what happens next after the gospel is preached throughout all the world? As a note, the internet makes this very possible as this at, at this point. Next comes the abomination of desolation, as described in the book of Daniel, the prophet. When that happens, which I'll note, which I'll not go into at this point, she says, someone can expand on that or research it further. But in short, I believe that is when something blasphemous is done in the temple. There would need to be a third temple. There are plans by Jews in Israel to build that already. 
that is when everyone who lives in Israel will be in trouble. This is the, this is described as the great tribulation when those in Judea flee to the mountains and are warned not to go back for anything. This is when the days are shortened for the sake of the elect. This is also when false Christs and false prophets appear again and if possible will deceive the elect. Immediately following this, the Son of Man returns. Then we have the eagles gathering where the carcasses are. One last note. Verse 20 adds, when you see Jerusalem compassed about with armies, then know thereof that the desolation thereof is near. These are my cliff notes from reading these passages. You did a great job, Mary Ranny. And I'm thinking that that's what Ricardo was referring to. That was the note that you left at the end. Yeah, I got it. Okay, you're saying I got it. Yep, that's it. Yeah, until the and then Ricardo says until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Good I, stuff. Yep. Very I, good. I'm, I'm feeling like verse twenty through twenty four are almost verbatim descriptions of the war of sixty seven to seventy A.D. Which doesn't mean that it, they that they don't in some way apply to his second coming. I do. I you know there's you can make a good argument of how Daniel describes the uh, Greek king that ruled during the time of uh, Hanukkah, the Hanukkah miracle. Um, mm -hmm. Yet, really, Daniel is also describing the Antichrist of the end. So, Bible repeats, or parallel events. We've talked about that before, I think, during when we read Daniel. Um, exactly, yep. Uh, la, 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 la. Okay, Sharon Lewis Roberts, Luke 21, 10 through 19. On the statement of things to come, I have taken the wars, famine, earthquakes as starting almost straight away after his death and resurrection. It's just going to really escalate towards the end where it's just constant tribulation. Rather than just having pockets of tribulation here and there throughout history, I perceive it to be worldwide all at the same time towards the end. With regards to verse 18 about not a hair will perish in your head, I'm perceiving that as spiritual, as the next sentence states, by your endurance you will gain your lives. Otherwise, it would not make sense to the persecuted ones that have died or will die. Exactly. Yeah. I'm perceiving that with you as well. In some version it says you will you will maintain or keep your soul, right? Is that what? Yes, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Luke twenty one nineteen. in your patience possess ye your souls yeah so yeah exactly so that that makes a bit more sense just like you said sharon very good comment uh christina man so awesome i love i just love these scriptures christina is christina says luke 21 4 regarding giving to the kingdom how many of us are in the same category as the pharisees most of us give out of our abundance men see the amount that is given while Yahweh sees the amount that remains the widow gave it all she had great faith equal to her giving she gave completely to Yahweh and depended completely upon Yahweh. Yeah. And this, this ties in. I don't – does anybody else talk about this? I don't want to steal. Okay. The other thing is, is this ties in with those people who also came to Yeshua and says, what more could I do? What, what more shall I do for the kingdom of God? And then he says, give everything away. Be completely and utterly reliant. And then we know that when Yeshua sends out the apostles for the first time to do miracles and cast out demons and stuff, he says to them, take nothing with you. Don't have a purse. Don't have money. Don't have an extra pair of clothing. Just go. And it's like he was teaching them the first lesson, which is like you're going to have to get used to a life of completely and utterly depending on me. And then when they went, right, granted he was alive, but when they went. And then they came back and he asked them, were you lacking anything? And they're like, no. He asked them later, which we'll get to that scripture actually coming up. So that's pretty cool. So. Nice. Yeah. Um, Cameron Peterson, Luke 21, 14 through 15. Settle it, therefore, in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. Wow. For some reason, I never caught this until now. How direct. I've believed this for a while, but it's pretty cool reading it in context. Praise God, our faithfulness each moment is the important thing. He will give us the words when we need them. Recently reading through James, 
uh, I, re I really became aware of how easy it is to go do things ourselves. James 4, 13 through 17. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? Mm. For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. There's a real call. There's a, yes. Go ahead. I'll talk there, about it. Go yeah. Ahead. There's a real call to do to a simple and quiet life throughout the Bible. When we live that that when we live that way, it allows God to be the one to exalt us, not us exalting ourselves. I guess I'm just encouraged because it makes the decisions in front of me relatively easy. Live faithfully, know God, his word, and he will take care of everything. So my question is something that's been on my mind recently. Should we make plans for anything, like life plans? I feel like I go back and forth on this. There seems to be a prudence in planning things out, but often the biblical teaching seems to show that we don't really need to. What do you and Alex think? Oh, do you not have Bob's comment? I may have added that later. So Bob gives a comment oh. to you, Cameron, too. He says, a man makes a plan, but the Lord directs his steps. It's good to pick a destination and move towards it, all the while applying scripture to our circumstances and adjusting accordingly. Good good addition there, Bob. Uh, uh, that's that's my persuasion as well. And I think, I think, like, these are great questions that I think that we as believers will ask. And, like, do we ever really understand how to walk with Christ? Like, I think like the only way that we'll ever really understand is that we just have to do the walk and then we kind of get to know him. Like, that might sound super not great answer or great teaching <laughs> for somebody who's new or something like that, trying to like, like, is there, God, he didn't, he, I don't personally like the whole, the Bible means, uh, what is it, uh, what is it? What is it? What do people say it is an acronym for? Basic instructions before leaving Earth. It's not what Bible means at all. It just means the book. But the the thing is, is I don't like that because the the Bible doesn't read as a manual. It'd be awesome if it did, right? I mean, there are parts of it where, ironically enough, like the Levitical law is a manual, and that was like when we and by that which we are we we know sin, right? Is because of the manual part. But in the in the teachings and the coachings of Yeshua, it's all the Holy Spirit will give you understanding. And that has to do with relationships. So, you know, if I were to answer your question, I would say I don't think like most of us know how exactly to walk with Christ and how to surrender to Christ until we do it. And then as like children and babies, we stumble and we fall and we bump our knees and we cry and that causes us to return to Christ and go, I'm messing up. I don't understand. This doesn't make sense. What's happening here? It's only as we look back do we end up realizing, oh, like I can see how God maneuvers in my life. And I can perceive clearly how he might maneuver maybe in like a close friend's life or a family member's life. And it might appear to be very different. And that if I went to a textbook manual, I would be like, well, this looks very confusing. But this passage in which we're reading tonight says, don't plan on like what you're going to say. Don't don't expect to have this great understanding that is a rigid answer. You're all going to memorize and regurgitate. He's saying the Holy Spirit will speak through you the things which cannot be denied. And it's like, again, that only reiterates relationship and also reiterates uniqueness. Every situation is going to be calling for a unique response from god not from us right so i i do believe that we can know but i feel that the way that we know is by matching scripture as a foundation to the relationship and then we get into that relationship and we stumble and we fall and that's where we learn how to walk in relationship with christ and it's really not fun i don't i don't, I don't find it fun personally 
uh, I think it's amazing to witness. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I don't find it exactly quote unquote fun. Uh, and, and, and a lot of times I find it to be very frustrating. Um, but at the same time, when I look back, right, hindsight's always twenty twenty. When I look back, I can see where the relationship was strong, where the relationship was weak. Uh, and then it really, and then that, those are the highlighted moments that really point towards what is it supposed to look like? So, and, and how are we supposed to do it? It's really awesome. <clears throat> if, if, if I may render some thoughts on this. Uh, yeah, of course. I, I don't think planning is the problem. I think wisdom is the problem. Uh, it, 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 the amount of wisdom with which the planning is being done is really the difference. God can make plans. God can make you aware of plans. God can lead you along an incredible plan that you could never come up with yourself. Right. Um, it's because you lack wisdom. We lack wisdom. We can ask for wisdom and sometimes make very prudent and wise plans. This is in regards to specifically the scripture, which talks about um, don't plan your speech. I'm not talking about that because I think you're asking a more general question. You're saying, but often the biblical, te you're saying uh, there seems to be a prudence in planning things out, but often biblical teaching seems to show how we don't really need to. So I think that's more, if I, I think you're asking a more general question about life, not just specifically about standing up and giving testimony. Um, well, he literally so, says the words like life plans, quote unquote. Right, like exactly, yeah. exactly. So yeah. you are indeed asking that question. So I think, you know, it, it's, it would be, it would be wrong to say never plan. Plans are to just go, just go completely and totally into the, into every day without a single thought of, of prudent planning. I think that would, might be incorrect and unwise in situations. Um, w wise planning, good. <laughs> Arrogant planning, uh, planning, uh, uh, bold planning when you have not enough information to even make a decent plan, not a wise idea, right? And taking things for granted, variables like you can't possibly uh, know, those things too are a foolish plan sometimes. But God may call you to do those things for which you see no plan, right? Like they will look foolish. Go step out there and say such and such thing or go do this for this other person in this manner right now. That's not if you start thinking plans about that, it'll completely go. Wait, what? That doesn't make any sense. So there's as as I, I feel like the Bible is telling us. Don't rely on a single answer that just goes across the board other than faith and like my brother says, relationship. Because in that relationship, then an uncommon wisdom can be can be bestowed to, upon you, an uncommon intuition. Suddenly, you do the right thing at the craziest time, and you can never explain to somebody how, <laughs> right? So, and and maybe, in some cases, that might be a crazy plan that you come up with. You come up with. When I say you, I don't mean you. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I think that that's the part that's a highlight, though, for sure, because the, the, in the quote that that Luke Cameron gives in James 4, 15, 4, James 4, 15 literally says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Right. So it's it's like you have a conceptual idea of what can be done. And then you say but we surrender this over to the will of God. And the next sentence is really important, which I think will cause us the confusion, right? 16 says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil because it says today and tomorrow, we will go into such and such town, spend a year there and trade and make profit. So the person is saying like, we have this plan, like, how a, probably like a CEO of a company is like how I think maybe we're all thinking or, you know, or a government official or something like that says, okay, well, let's set a date, let's set a schedule, let's do this thing. And let's work. Then the result is going to be ABC. And when you do that, I think that's the other thing too. Like we see it, at least in American government, it never works out. Like nothing ever happens on schedule. Nothing's in budget, right? It never actually works out as you plan, which only ends up making you look arrogant and like an idiot. And it's saying that the behavior of, is that is evil. So I think that what my brother Alex is saying is it's not that you don't have a plan, 
that's that's literally what he is saying right but it's more like uh it's like are you seeking your own wisdom also with your own desired result but if you seek the wisdom of god in your plan you surrender to god also changing that plan or changing footsteps exactly. within that plan to an uh, to an end result you could not fathom when and that david also is kind of what alex just said right like when we can, we can yeah. actually have an outcome we didn't even there's no way we could have planned when david was t when david made the blueprints for the temple he was making a plan did god destroy those blueprints and said you're an idiot david these are how dare you no quite the opposite it was god in, a god inspired plan when or or a god sanctioned or even a god blessed plan let's put it that way when when uh what did what did uh solomon ask for he asked for wisdom and god said you've asked correctly so with wisdom i will give you basically all your plans will work out <laughs> you know what i mean so like yeah. it's 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 you know there's 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 what the world teaches you prudent plans are um, and that might be totally like lame, right? In God's eyes. But um, if you seek out God's prudence, you can have the most intricate of plans. You can have a perfect blueprint for the perfect temple. You know what I'm saying? Like there is no limit. There is nothing that says God is limited by you, by plans. He's not limited by plans. He will, he will make use of plans. So that's all. That's all I wanted to say about that. in regards to life and projects and things and not in regards to specifically what he says in the scriptures that we just read about testifying for Yeshua. There he says, do not yeah. make a plan. And that is, that is, to, I, I believe absolutely 100% take that literally do not make a plan. And I've experienced the difference between uh, trying to come up with ahead of time of what to say. And then finding myself in the moment saying the absolute right things that I was shocked came out of me. And I know that this is totally a truth. Um, when we know and plan what to say, it is invariably never good enough. It is never good enough. Uh, because we, we have no clue as to what's going on in the minds of everybody that we're listening, that are listening. But God does. God has a clue. <laughs> He's more than a clue. So. Yeah, amen. Minimum. So to just clarify, so based on what you, you were just saying is you're saying that when it comes to when you go before leaders or you have to speak onto your persecution, don't have a plan of what you're going to say, trust in the Lord completely, like literally don't have a plan, just trust that the words are going to come to you. And then, but as in regards to a life plan, you have a life plan, but you surrender those plans to God and his will be done within those plans, or he can guide or change those plans. But it's it's you're surrendering it perpetually to him is yeah, my understanding you, that's uh, what you, you were saying yeah you you just just for the record you so ask him essentially lord you know he knows the contents of your heart the contents of your fears and anxieties one of the main things that causes people anxiety it is just everyday life one of the main things that causes people anxiety is uncertainty of the future and the truth of the matter is we can't be certain about any future like your comment clearly explains or or like james clearly explains if you make crazy <laughs> plans about we're going to go to this city we're going to make a profit all is going to be good let's party well hello like there's a whole you just you, you just completely just made a completely arrogant statement that can be totally derailed and yeah, yeah. and you're, you're 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 partying instead of maybe going to the lord and going lord i have this idea to go to the city and to make this money and to feed my family or to feed my, you know, lots of people. And I think it's a good idea, but I'm actually terrified because I don't really know if it's going to work. So, hmm, well, that's, that's, that's the truth. So you start with the truth and you seek the Lord in prayer, etc., for, for a, either a confirmation that this idea is going to be okay or, or a feeling or an idea or some kind of plan that will suddenly improve your odds of succeeding in this plan. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that's what my brother's talking about relationship. You engage in talking to God about your plans, right? You haven't sinned. If you want to think of a plan, 
like you haven't really sinned. If you engage God in speaking about this to him, you, you, you've, you've done the best thing, in my opinion, you could do with a thought that just came into your head. You've asked God, is this okay? Is this a good idea? Like, Lord, send me wisdom. <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. I think there's just so many, there's so many of examples in the Old Testament of this exactly. When, especially when Israel was trying, you know, be Israel and move into Jerusalem or, you know, or the Hebrews were trying, were in the desert and waiting to move into Israel. You, you, there's so many examples of, of the things that they wanted to do or they wanted to plan, especially after they came into Israel and the tribes broke up and they each did their thing. There were so many times where the kings or the leaders or the generals had these plans. And then like that was like it was kind of ridiculous because they were constantly making plans. And then God, God would show up and he's like, that's worst of all, you're not even going to lead these troops in. I'm going to get this fat farmer over here who's never done anything but lifted a pitchfork to move some hay and feed some cows. And he's going to choose some dudes who drink funny out of the river. And those are going to be the 300 dudes who go and kill everybody. Like, like I, and hmm. that's, that's what there's so many instances in the Bible where they did have like their intellect and they had their skills. But the thing is, is that did God ever use that intellect and skills? Yes. He allowed David to design the basic template of the temple. He allowed Solomon to add further details to the temple, which in my opinion were quite strange, not judging Solomon God. But, and then the other thing was, is like, for instance, the man who knew how to make the ephod or the man who knew how to make the, um, the, um, the cherubims for the Ark of the Covenant. Like God says, there's a man. When you go find this man, he already has it within his talent to design this as I want it done. Right. So does God take people with certain abilities and their abilities? Like, I say and take people with certain abilities and their abilities, but take certain people with their abilities and then and then God appoints the activity or the direction and we have within us that which will be required for the journey. I feel like throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament, that's exactly how it really goes, that God equips us with innate either understandings of things or we have certain abilities we team up with other people who have certain abilities. And when we come together, we take a look at what God is telling us to do. And the path has been, it, it gets revealed to us, right? Like that, that's how I perceive it in the, in the Bible, right? So, and, and I perceive that in my life that any time, every time my entire life has been full of uh, pain and suffering and collapses and falls and brokenness was always because i would take a look at what looks like to be a, a plan from god and go well that doesn't make sense to me or that's going to put me in an uncomfortable situation like gideon right lord i'm a fat farmer and you want me to go lead military like wrong guy wrong place wrong time right like and we're trying to argue with god but like i feel like that's another thing just if we're going to have this conversation like I feel the Bible is totally riddled with the question you're asking here, Cameron. And and I feel like if we really think about it, God is absolutely crystal clear. You're going to make plans. And if my hand is upon you, they're not going to go well because you didn't stop and go, Lord, what is your plan in this moment? Right. And I feel like I feel like as silly as that is, and, and, and so I see your hand is up, brother, I won't, but let me just speak to something because I get a lot of emails and phone calls or not phone calls, but chats like from people. The other thing is, is there's so many people who might be watching this video right now and goes, okay, you know, guys, Alex, Nathan, Cameron, everybody else like having the conversation on this video about this. That's all fine and dandy, all the fun, crazy, wonderful things you're saying. Have a plan. Wait for God. Wait for God to put it on your heart. Some people out there watching this video, and it may not be you who are watching this right now, live, whatever, but there are people who watch this video that I know are sitting there going, first, I never have a plan. I am an idiot, right? Like, I don't know what to do. My left hand never knows what my right hand is doing, so I'm never going to be in danger of that. They're like, I don't have a plan. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know which way is north. And then those are the same people who may also be saying, I also never hear from God. I never get that wooey wooey feeling. I never get the Holy Spirit guiding me, right? But but what I, but so to that, I want to say that's when we go to scripture, right? Like if you're one of those people who are like, I don't have a plan, 
I don't get the Holy Ghost wooey wooey feeling. And I'm reading now in the Bible that I'm not supposed to make a plan. I am literally a bump on a log. Like I am just a human being full of, you know, guts, blood, muscle tissue, and bone. I, I'm there's like that means I would never do anything. I have gotten those emails from people before. And so what I want to say to that is that that's why I believe we look to scripture, right? And we look to the things that God tells us to do with our lives. So this may not apply to 99% of the people watching this video, but I, I don't want to leave that last little group out who are going to be super frustrated by, and, and you've written me before with the conversation of like, oh, listen to God and he'll move you. Or, you know, you make a plan, like to those people who not have neither of those, we look to scripture and we look at the things in which he does, which is, and I'm going to, I'm going to cover this very fast. I, I, I hope in Yeshua's name, be a good steward, love your neighbor as yourself, you know, seek the Lord in all that you do, give your, what talents or activities you do in your life, surrender them over in a sense of saying, I hope this is blessing God. I hope that the people who are witnessing me doing this, or I hope that the duties in which I'm doing, whether I'm playing softball with my friends, bowling with my friends, you know, sending out my email or doing my presentation at work or whatever it is that you do, answering the phones at work, plumbing at work, whatever it is that you do, you're, you're saying, I hope that I'm representing Christ in what I do. So if you don't have a plan, that's the plan. Whatever you do already, do it onto Christ. However you live life, live it onto Christ. And then trust, this is, the, this is the other part that's not necessarily mentioned here, but it is mentioned with every single person who God calls in the Bible, like Gideon. He calls them to trust, them to trust, us to trust, that it's going to work out, that though we cannot hear God, we cannot see God, we cannot feel God and the Holy Ghost moving in us and guiding, quote unquote, our steps as the apostles or David or, you know, Gideon or anybody like that. You know, we have to trust that when we surrender over our members and surrender over our heart and seek him and read the Bible and and seek to be a blessing unto others and count others more significant than ourselves, think like this, excuse me, things like this, that God is going to work in them, right? So, so for those of you who don't have a plan, you can't come up with one, and you feel very lost, you're, you're at a perpetual crossroad, never know which direction to go to, and, and you never feel the wooey-wooey of the Holy Spirit guiding you, you're actually, believe it or not, at a great spot. Because it means that you actually cannot go necessarily against God unless you decipher or try to manipulate or create a plan. Do you get what I like? You're, you, you then try to take your intellect or, or something like that to create a plan. But if you just live with the opportunities that God has presented you, your house, your family, your job, these are things that God has obviously given you if you're doing them. And then you try to do your best to glorify him in those things. And that is a great plan and and that it might feel like you're in a perpetual crossroad but it's within that perpetual crossroad that i am persuaded you will indeed look back on your life and realize that you were not stuck at the same place that god moved in you he moved you and in that movement and in those things that you did god was there so i, I hope that speaks to those people who are who are in falling into that category so in this in this conversation i i think i think it's brilliant you you totally nailed it and it's along the lines of what i was kind of feeling to say and i don't think it just applies to people who feel who feel lost or or not very capable of making a plan or don't feel empowered to make plans and i think it applies to all of us in the sense that it's not so much a plan we figure out but a blueprint for wise actions profitable actions have been laid out in the bible as you say and Yeshua does mention that the only profitable actions really are love your neighbor as yourself and all the things you've just listed and mm -hmm. and that all other seek the kingdom of heaven and all other things will be added on to you. Mm -hmm. okay. And so exactly. and so you may find that now your plan is murky or confused or you don't even have the desire to make one. Um but if you take the steps and follow the promises um, of the scriptures in the things that my brother just pointed out, have the faith 
that one day you may find yourself suddenly filled with amazing plans and it'll be shocking yeah. to you and i'm not Good saying word, you know so so yeah that's yeah that's it awesome and real quick before we move on to the next comment we're almost done by the way guys we have one more comment with a comment replied to it so we're on we're on time roll with us for just a few more minutes here but real quick the the passage of james 4:17 so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. Uh, this is a thing that I talk about a lot in my ministry. And if anybody was wondering, like, you know, is there a passage in the Bible that really like hits upon, for instance, I use the example of like, if God tells a, you an individual never cut your hair, but he tells you that individual never cut your hair. Right. Because that's something he's called you to do. If you do cut your hair, then it is a sin onto you. But that doesn't mean that you get to go to everybody else and say, hey, uh, God told me to never cut my hair. So that means you, too, should never cut your hair. Right. So whosoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it to him, it is sin. So that's the thing, too, that the more you know about the Bible, which is another part of the conversation here that I, that I often talk about in my Q&A videos, is that. The more you know the Bible and the more you experience the Bible and live out the Bible, the more you are responsible and the less wiggle room you have. And so recent videos I have made, I talked about this applying to me and where my level of guilt comes from is that I know what I'm supposed to do. I know how I'm supposed to live, uh, you know, to the degree that I do. And therefore, I am guilty of the, all those things because I know better than to do them. So here, James 4, 17 is the very scripture that really hits that point home that I talk about a lot. So anyways, there you go. Uh, Sharon Lewis Roberts. Am I, you read the last one or did yeah. I? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. I, I read Sharon Lewis Roberts, Luke 21, verse 36. This verse here, it states, pray, you have strength to escape all things. A lot of the pre-trib sector uses this as confirmation for not having to go through it and that they will escape. I'm taking it, we pray for strength to get through that particular season of trouble rather than actually escape totally. And that standing before the son of man would mean towards the end when he comes back, where the remnant remnant are taken up in line with the signs he's given us. So you haven't physically perished in the tribulation, but endure till the end when he arrives. Emphasis on the praying you may have strength to escape all things. I don't see a guarantee where your our fate ends. Um, it's more like an encouragement to pray. I also came across this verse in Zephaniah, Two verse two through three, before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like a chafe, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord, seek the Lord, all you humble of the all you humble of the land, who do His just commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. This is just my perception on it, though. I know many others might see it differently. Thank you, Sharon, for not only writing that out, but writing it in the way you did. That was absolutely beautiful. Sarah Peterson replies, you says, I like this. I agree with your perception of this ver of these verses. I know in verse 35, it kind of provides more context that helps me agree with you. For as a snare trap shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So to me, it seems that there will be traps set for all of us on earth by the enemy. And our prayer is that we will escape those traps so we can be counted worthy. But I can see how the pre-trib people could look just at verse 36 and think, that if they pray, they will escape the end times troubles by rapture. But I am not sure in context that it makes sense that this is speaking of a rapture. So I like both of your ladies' comments. Uh, and I, I am in agreement with both of you. And uh, I am persuaded, too, that not only is it as you have said, which is, you know, uh, we may have a way out of the traps of the of, of, of the of the times. Uh, which is not to be 
taken off the planet at that time yet but we we go through it but we just have a way out uh the this is where a lot of my persuasion is is that you know the lamp oil that we are to have filled up to be prepared is yes of course biblical as spiritual but if we are spiritually filled i believe that that means we will be spiritually awake to see the traps you know for instance if bible tells us that we have to do something in order to eat or we have to do something in order to get paid, or we have to do something in order to have a job or or anything like this, have a roof over our head or clothes on our body, right? Then it would make sense that if we are in prayer and we are reading the scripture and we are seeing, you know, seeking the Lord's uh, guidance in these ways, we're not looking for a, a, a way to escape, but we're looking for a way through. I feel like if you do read these scriptures in the ways that you are pointing out here, you two ladies are pointing out here, you will look for a way through rather than saying, I'm not going to be here. I don't have to do anything. And I feel like that in of itself is a trap, right? So like if, if, cause then it, it means that you're not prepared, right? So that's just my two cents that, that uh, on top of your sense. So. Yeah. I'm in agreement with everything you guys just said, including Nathan. I, I think, I, it's a great and hopeful um it's a great and hopeful verse that that actually fits with the discussion we just had i don't know how you can do it or anyone can plan to escape all of the travails right all of the tribulations described here let alone in revelation uh if you consider your life today and how prepared you might be for all the various disasters that can happen that you're aware of you will find yourself wanting to drop your hands and going, you know what? <laughs> okay. If I start trying to prepare a plan to escape all of this, uh it's it becomes insane. Um and uh and and enormously difficult even if you can conceive a plan. My point is that the the, the scripture here says pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all the things that shall come to pass and stand before the son of man. That means you're going to be here when he comes, you're going to stand yeah. before him and that you're going to get your, you, if you are found worthy, you will, I, I take this as you will receive help and uncommon wisdom, uh, a know what to do and where to go that will make no sense and no plan can ever. It's, it's like the, uh, you know, there's, um, I never saw the movie. I think it was called Hacksaw Ridge or something. It was about the believer in the middle of yeah. World War II who uh, was a doctor and medic who refused to pick up a gun and shoot people and survived an insane battle where everybody yeah. was just getting blown up left and right. And he, and he yeah. walked through it all while carrying people on his back. Okay, tell, yeah. me, tell me he planned that. Of course not. Right. Tell me that's not a miracle. Of course it's a miracle. But yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah, um, and he only he only stayed in the war for three days, but but he lived, so it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he got wounded in the end, but that wound wasn't deadly, and it didn't even paralyze him, or he didn't lose a leg or an arm or anything. In all, in all, end of the end, it, it's pretty miraculous. Like I mean, yeah. I I know exactly. And he was a massive hero. Uh, yeah. Technically, <laughs> technically, I'm here because of a something similar. My grandfather uh, was in the Soviet army during World War II at the beginning of the war which was a bad army to be in at the beginning of the war. Well, all of them were bad, but you get it. Uh, he wound up being in all the major battles at the beginning, including Stalingrad. And he landed while Stalingrad was under siege. I think he landed uh, uh, with the rest of his squad, crossed the river, and then some mortar shell blew up several meters or something ahead of him. And he got hit with a bunch of dirt and rock and got knocked out and got medevaced out, which is like insane for that particular time of the war. My point basically is he survived he survived that tribulation through something like that that he could never have planned or prepared for. And I believe that um, uh, the scripture can give us hope in that by some crazy circumstance and miracle, we're guided through to be able to make it through uh, the tribulations. If we're accounted worthy. Amen. May it be so. In Yeshua's name. Amen. In Yeshua's name. 
Yeah, amen, amen, amen. You guys have some good comments. You guys are having a conversation among yourselves, so I don't necessarily want to read it, right? Like for the video's sake, but you guys are just having conversations about these that I perceive people will be having conversations about it, talking about, you know, how can you make a plan, these things and that. And you're also talking about the churches and stuff. And, uh, you know, may we, may you know, that's the thing that we should, we should add to our prayer is but specifically for this body of Christ. I want to, I want to start praying for this body of Christ to be shown what to do. Uh, we're all over the world. That's the thing is that's, that's one of the things that for me, I, I will confess, like I, I don't have a plan uh, for, you know, how this body of Christ will maintain or, you know, I, other than a website, but I don't have a plan on how, how will we continue to fellowship and be together or be there for each other uh, when, uh, you know, the times come, let's say. And I often think about, I think about that a lot. And I, I don't know if I would say that I have, I have ideas of what can accomplish a, an objective, uh, but I have zero plan on how to do it. (laughs) So uh, mainly because I'm low on my resources. I had a plan before, and that was one of the, one of my, uh, the banes of my existence was I had a plan and God took that plan away. And that's very interesting because it shows also how absolutely arrogant and foolish I was, which matches the script we read today, even though my plan was looking good and was almost complete. Uh, but yeah, it was still uh, foolish because as he said, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And uh, my plan got a dose, a heavy dose of that. I did not, I did not, there was no way for me to plan for the final blow uh, where it all came crumbling down. So it's, it is an interesting thing. And I think it totally applies, uh, specifically in my life. I don't know about yours, but it totally applies in my life and definitely yes. want to continue to pray for, uh, this body of Christ in which I get to fellowship with and participate with that. We all be given uh, insight and understanding of how we can escape these traps specifically that will be placed on us, uh, because we will not participate in the ways of the world. That's a great prayer. Call that the Luke 21 prayer. <laughs> amen. So I lift that up in amen. Yeshua's name. If you'll join me with an amen, that'd be awesome. Amen. May we all, may, may we literally get a very clear guidance from him specifically on that in Yeshua's may we, name. May we be found worthy. May we, may yeah. we be accounted may we be found worthy. One. Yeah, exactly. To, That's a good, you know. Jeez. Well, you guys can be... <laughs> You stop it. You stop it. Lord. May I be you stop Lord. that. Yes. Yeah, so you work that out, Lord. I, I, I receive that. I receive that. <laughs> exactly. God's got some creative. God, listen, if anybody can do creative accounting, it's the Lord Almighty God. So there you go. Yeah, amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. He's a very creative accountant. Plus, his blood pays, his blood pays for a lot of things. Exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. His, Otherwise, what's its value? Currency. His currency runs quite deep. Oh, <laughs> his yes. Pockets, his pockets in the spirit realm are infinite. So Infinite. Hey, exactly. We, we worship the infinite living God, right? So hallelujah for that. Praise be to the Lord. And I just did something. I don't know. what. Oh, I just messed up my computer. Okay. All right. We're back. All right. Well, hey, you guys. Wonderful comments. Wonderful conversation. Thank you, everybody, for all that you wrote and did uh, and the clarity in which we are able to talk out these things in conversation uh, like what Ricardo did with the uh, Matthew poll on, uh, on that. So that was great clarity for me. Uh, uh, I realize I have to do better on, on that. I have to spend more time in scripture before I, before I, I talk, uh, I realize I've been kind of dropping the ball on that recently and I, I apologize. So anyways, we'll, I'll get better at that. I just been a bit overwhelmed lately. So not an excuse, not an excuse. Amen. All right. Be blessed. Be the blessing. Love you guys. Yes. Love you guys.